three, two, one. Hey, Buzzheads, welcome to uh, Buzzhead Radio. Buzzhead Radio. Buzzhead Radio. Buzzhead Radio. Everybody, welcome to another episode of Buzzhead Radio. Oh, it's a special episode. For it is a special episode. Don't forget, if you guys want to give us a holler, it's 580-541-3805 is the official Buzzhead hotline. Or you can email us at buzz at buzzheadmedia.com. So, yeah, like you said, uh, tonight is going to be a special episode. Episode. It is in conjunction with uh, several people, but let's get a quick announcement out of the way. Uh, if you guys need your car worked on, if you have any auto body problems, don't forget to give Ken Hunnell and the clan over at Enid Auto Body a shout. Shout, shout, shout to the. Oh, no, don't shout to the. No, that's, a, that's a song. Yeah, they got a really cool thing online. You can go to EnidAutoBody.com and click on the estimate link. Um, you can you just take pictures of your car, you know, walk around, get a good, you know, get several good pictures of the damaged area, send it to them. They'll get on the phone with you, get you all taken care of. It's 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 really cool, you know. And you know what? You can go in there and there's a big window, so you can see all the cars that they're working on. You can see your car being worked on. You can go in there whenever you want. No, they'll, they'll take you back in there and show you what's going on. Pretty cool. Or you can call them at five eight zero. Two three four five four nine two. I should have that number memorized by now, but I don't. One of these days you will. But anyway, the reason we even bring that up is because Enid Auto Body is the official sponsor of the Buzzhead Radio podcast. So we appreciate them helping us keep this podcast on the air. So uh, shout out to Blazer Pro. Uh, so Justin went and set up the recording equipment and the cameras. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, there is also a video version at youtube.com slash Enid Buzz. So it's all on video. Uh, if you're watching this on video on YouTube, you can just listen to the audio version on pretty much any podcasting app. And the podcast is called Buzzhead Radio. Uh, but Which so you should be listening to anyway. You should be listening to it. Because we talk about Enid every week, kind of the events. This week, we're not really going to talk about much because we're going to leave uh, the ep- the interview to be most of the episode this week. So, uh, so basically what... Um, they all got together. Uh, Justin Blazer recorded everything. Thank you, Justin. Frank Baker and April and Cindy Allen uh, all ask uh, questions, and so you guys will get to hear the podcast coming up. So uh, we're just going to kind of turn it over to those guys. And again, we want to thank uh, Cindy Allen with the Enid News and Eagle. We want to thank April Danahay, and we want to thank Frank Baker f- and uh, Blazer Pro for yeah. bringing this next interview. So uh, you guys listen up. Well, welcome in. I'm Frank Baker, and this is going to be a very fun afternoon, evening, early morning, whenever the heck you're watching this. Uh, we're here at City Hall, City of Enid, and it's a great opportunity to see where the city's going in the future and also where we've been in the past. And, and to help us uncover all that, we have a former city commissioner and current city commissioner, Rob Stallings, and at the head of the table... Uh, we'll call him Daddy. We have Mayor David Mason, who's our current mayor and a former city commissioner as well. And then going on around the horn, looking radiant in green, April Danahay, head Hello. of corporate communications and human resources at Security National Bank. Yes, and used to cover the city beat quite a bit for radio. She was a great news director back in the day. She's tough. I and speaking tough. of tough, Cindy Allen, the oh, publisher yes. of the Enid News and Eagle. The toughest of all. Yeah, we well, are. <laughs> I wouldn't argue with that. So, guys, this is, before we get started, we've got a whole array of city things to talk about. But first off, let's let's get a little background, because, I mean, I've known both you gentlemen for a while. A lot of people know you, but maybe in general, in terms of background, not so much. So, Rob, we'll start with you. Give us a little bio on the Rob Stallings, if you would. Well, my bio is no secret, uh, thanks to Cindy Allen. Uh, <laughs> when you run for political office, they print everything they, they know, that you'll give them about you and on the front. And he's also pillar of the plains. Yes, he front is. Page. That's right. So, uh, but I did. Uh, I, I grew up in the Deep South in Georgia. I went to school at Auburn, 
so I'm working my way this way. Um, I ended up having to get into the Air Force to stay out of the Vietnam draft and ended up at Vance Air Force Base. Went through pilot training here and uh, spent, uh, spent my six years of military service in Enid and forgot to go home. Uh, <laughs> and we're glad that worked out that way. <laughs> it, it's, it's worked out great for us. Uh, done oil and gas business, started an engineering business, uh, been a city commissioner, was in the mid-80s uh, during the uh, times that we all like to forget. And mm. for some of the uh, younger people, it was a very, very uh, turbulent time in Enid when the uh, stock, the price of oil tumbled um, and banks shut down. Mm -hmm. Even here in Enid, it was, it was a very, very tough time. And then made it through that and then decided to come back to the city commission and not quite sure why but, <laughs> but i did and i've really enjoyed it and uh was unopposed for my second term and i guess i got uh, four more years good so, good glad to have you here how about your family my family's great i have a i have a wife mary who uh, is very engaged and uh, everybody loves much more than me and we got, She's I'm very a, sweet. I'm in a similar situation. I leave with Carmen whenever possible. And we have lots of grandkids from <laughs> from Georgia to uh, Kansas City to Edmond. It's a lot of fun. Good, good. And I, before I officially introduce David Mason to do a little bio, first time I met David, I heard him before I met him, and all my fam most of my family is from down in southwest Oklahoma. He hollered from his office, and I heard that southwest Oklahoma slash Texas twang. So I bet I like this guy. <laughs> Turned out I did. David Mason, who is our mayor, former city commissioner, kind of like with Rob, uh, give us a little background on you. I will. I will. Um, I uh, moved to Enid in 2006 and from Altus, uh, which... 30 miles Been from there. Texas in two directions. So, yep. yes, there's a lot of Texas twang in that. Um, <clears throat> I uh, moved up here with work, and um, I knew one person when I moved to Enid and uh, moved my three boys up here uh, with me and just loved Enid. It didn't take any time at all to just have so many friends and know so many people. Got involved in civic clubs and organizations and uh, – Met my wife up here, uh, Melanie, and I, like Rob, have a much better, kinder wife than I am, and uh, just a just a person with a great heart, cares about people. So I was very, very fortunate to meet her. We're a blended family. We have five boys, and um, yeah, <laughs> five boys and two grandsons. Oh boy! But now we're getting two. Uh, well, we've got. Two grand, or uh, I'm sorry, two uh, daughter-in-laws, and Melanie. So she's not the only female <laughs> in the family, and and uh, <clears throat> they all live close. Um, we still have one at OU and one at OSU, so they're they're getting close to finishing up. And uh, I did serve as Ward Six Commissioner. I, I took the last two years for uh, Mayor Panikin whenever he moved over to Mayor. Mm -hmm finished that out and just loved it. Uh, had a great time. It was during COVID, you know. And <laughs> what fun. <clears throat> what fun. <clears throat> I didn't realize that you can have a four-and-a-half-hour city council meeting, oh, but yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. okay. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, come up. George decided not to run, and 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 I I like city government. I always have. So, put my name in the put my name in the ring and managed to win that. And and so I guess I'm 18 days in now as mayor, and I've I've loved every day of it. Very cool. So one quick question before we get rolling mm -hmm. here, and I'll, I'll let April and Cindy take the bulk of this, but I think it's got to be so helpful to in both cases to have been here before. Because so often you see a new city commissioner or mayor come in, and there's almost a deer in the headlight and a pretty big arc to get up to speed, particularly maybe if they don't have a, a business background or it's all new to them. So how much, and Rob, I'll go with you first, how much do you think having been here before has made it easier for you to step in again as a city commissioner? Well, there's two pieces to that. I guess the first piece being from when I was a, a commissioner back in the 80s to when I became a commissioner 
recently, yeah. and there wasn't a lot of parallel there. There was a lot of differences because the biggest thing is the city didn't have any money in the 80s. We had nothing to spend. All we were trying to do was pay our bills. Yep. And now, fortunately, we got a lot of good things going on. We can do things because we have money. And the difference between the last, uh, my last term and the one I'm in now, very little. <laughs> I didn't miss a day, in fact. So it's, a, it's almost like it's just an eight-year term, So which I'm thankful for, not having to campaign. Okay. And David, your perspective on that? I, uh, I will say it was very helpful. Whenever I come on as Ward 6 Commissioner, it, it was a lot of information coming at oh you real God. quick. And if you don't understand Tsunami. how the budgets work and you don't understand where all the money's at and what you can move and what you can't move and you don't understand all the projects that are already underway and the ones that they're trying to plan for which will actually be two years out uh, it, it's hard to get that concept and uh, I, I will say it took probably a, a year uh, whenever I come on as Ward 6 to uh, finally where I felt like I was understanding the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now then coming back as mayor, while it's a different position, um, it, it helps a lot to have that experience and, and to understand how to work with the commissioners and make those phone calls. And um, it's just a huge help, I think. Um, also, as, as mayor, um, I think they forget the amount of time that it takes. Oh, I know. You know, I, know. I was under the impression it was going to be part-time. <laughs> you know. Surprise! <laughs> yeah, it, it, it would be tough if you had a really 40-hour-a-week job to try to do that and do it well. So, well, one of our previous mayors, and I, you know, good guy, and you know, and he tried to make, still working full time at the time, and he tried to make every meeting, and he said, God, I lost so much billing, you know, just in terms of business, <laughs> because I really tried to do it right, and I don't think people have a clue, particularly in the, well, Cindy, you, well, it's, yeah, you've been mayor before. I have, and it's important city. to remember that these guys aren't paid. I mean, this is a volunteer position, you know, and so they're giving of their time and their service, and so, you know, I think that that people should appreciate that if nothing else you yeah. know when, when somebody's uh, whether you, whether you like them whether you like the decisions they make you know so people need to understand this is this is a volunteer job you know so yeah and it, it does take a lot of time and I was working full-time and had a I also was uh, kids, I had, well I was pregnant during my term as city commissioner <laughs> and mayor so yeah that more was fun, fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. So I was pregnant and had a had an infant during my time as mayor. In fact, my, my son was one year old when I was mayor. So, yeah. Well, in April, I know you thought about actually running at some point, but mm -hmm. you've worked with a number of people throughout the years, various places who've been on city commission, I think, mm -hmm. and you've covered it. So you have a good feel for the sometimes insane proportions of the gig. Well, I have not actually run for office, um, but I have contemplated it. I but then have. I came back You'd to my good. sanity and <laughs> I decided not to run. But it, while we're sitting talking about that, Frank, you are a former city commission. So, you know, from what you're asking these questions really comes from what your own experiences were. So when you ran for office the first time, did you have a clue what you were getting into? I didn't. I was absolutely, I just, I felt, because I thought I was a smart person until I walked in. And they always bring you in just when budget hearings are starting. That's exactly and God, right. You want to you be yes. made to feel ignorant. It was like, I would call up David Azell at night, who preceded me on city commission, and go, Azell, what the hell does this mean? Mm -hmm. But do you think, since you brought that up, do you think there's a danger in city staff kind of at some points having a conclusion on a given issue and they're trying to lead you and if you don't have a little perspective they might kind of take you and i'm not talking about anything specific but uh do you think sometimes city staff kind of has a preconceived notion of where they'd like to go and it's up to the commission to perhaps question that hmm. uh you know and I, I think a lot of our folks here i'm not trying mm -hmm. to be but I, I sense that happens sometimes I could see in some departments that could be possible. Um, in in our road construction, our engineering, I mean, they, with the exception of Rob, they off, obviously know a lot more about that field than what we could possibly right. know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when they throw a number out of what we think that's going to cost, it's always sticker shock. You never oh, think it's possible yes. that it could be. 
You know, so you're sitting there thinking, how can we cut the cost on that? Well, concrete is what concrete is mm -hmm. and the amount of labor. So, yes, I think they tried to a little bit lead us on some of those areas. But overall, uh, we, we get a lot of information on that both ways. Uh, the thing that people don't see a lot of time, those little tablets we carry around, they send us pages and pages and pages of information. It's not unusual for there to be, this last week there was probably 300 pages of information on each topic for us oh, to go through. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so Do they have it on a tablet now? It's all on a Because in my day, I, yeah, on Thursday, folders, I would get, a, no, I'd get uh -huh. it just a packet delivered right, to my well, office. It's yeah. on tablets, and for me, um, they print it. So I've got it in both places <laughs> whenever I'm sitting up there. But that being said, I, I think, especially our staff, they do a good job giving us a lot of information for us to look at. And then we have as much time as we want to ask questions. A lot of our questions are even addressed before we get up there. Uh, I couldn't count the number of times I picked up the phone and go, hey, what is this item and why are we doing this? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, Rob can speak to that also. So when you see us get up there and we ask three questions about a the $4 million item, it's because we've already looked at it. We've kicked it around. We've talked about it. Uh, uh, when I was Ward 6 Commissioner, my first night, we passed the budget, right? I hadn't <laughs> seen the excited. budget. I know. It's it insane. And, uh, it is insane. Uh, I got home and someone called me and said, I can't believe y'all spent like five minutes on that. <laughs> I'm going, look, I'm not sure how this deal works, but I know that they told me they've been in budget hearings now for <laughs> weeks. So I think there was more thought than that put in it. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course there is. So I, I'm probably kind of babbling, but I don't think we're being led in one direction or the other. Okay. I, I think we get to ask our own questions. Go Speaking, ahead. well, thank you. Speaking mm -hmm. of questions of, and, and the budget and coming in and having to vote right away on a budget, do you think, uh, now looking back, because you're in, C in looking back to your first time, did you come to city commission meetings? Did you go to the budget hearings when you knew you were elected and going to have to vote on the budget? I mean, how much preparation does it take to really walk in? Because it is a big budget. It has a lot of things that affects almost everybody in Enid, whether they know it or not. It does. So I think that's a good point. When I, when I got elected the second time, I started going to study sessions and going to the meetings in advance of it because I knew what was coming. But, you know, someone that's never been there, they don't really understand that they're going to start feeding you with a fire hose <laughs> on the first day. That's true. Yeah. And you better be ready. So, yeah. Yeah. And I've always told people that after they got elected, you really need to start going. Even before you, before you're even... When you're running for when office. You're running for I appreciated when I saw if, candidates if you, if you in, the com, in the commission chambers but while they were right. running. You don't know mm -hmm. the issues exactly. that no, we're dealing with. And uh, so I, th I think that... In, Going back to the city manager, I served under three, and I think Gerald by far is the best, and he, he absolutely does not try to lead us. He provides us information, and if you don't, you know, if, if we disagree with him, even though he might personally think this is the best way to go, he doesn't try to lobby us. He doesn't try to, 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 to push us at all, so I, I really respect him. I suspect some of that's his military mm -hmm. um, Background. Kind of background chain, chain of command type thing. Yeah, I, he I recognizes agree. that, you know, we can do the deal if we want to. and But I, I, I can't even think of a time when we've had to go over and tell him, no, Gerald, we're not doing that. <laughs> Mr. Stallings, didn't, um, was Jim Furry your first city manager you served with? No, um, there was a guy before Jim Furry. Um, Lyle? No. Bill Gamble? Wasn't Gamble no, Gamble was here when I first came to town. You guys not remember this guy, his Bob. Uh, yeah. Bob Elliot. Elliot. Bob Elliot. Uh, yes, of I course forgot, I remember him. I'd forgotten Bob. Went on to make a huge thing out of a trash mountain ski valley yeah. somewhere. <laughs> I mean, he really did. He, he made a, a point of making some of their their landfill use in another town into like a... a ski slope. Yeah. I forgot Way that. to go. Hazards were tires sticking. I don't know about that. <laughs> but but he wasn't like that necessarily that popular at the time, if as I remember, because he wanted to... Um, cement all the medians 
if if I remember correctly, there was at the time he thought that would cut down on mowing. It would. <laughs> I had forgotten that. But yeah, that I believe was a wildly that was popular Bob approach. Elliot. And global warming. And global warming. <laughs> he was ahead of the curve. Uh, but I believe that was him as as the city manager was. in that it time, it um, and it uh-huh. wasn't. It wasn't unpopular, but it was kind of just different. I don't know what we were thinking, because that was also the time when, on our overpass on the north side, uh, we planted, um, not we, there was an Indian blanket field planted, and people went nuts because when they're done blooming, they look like weeds, they're, which they're, is something similar to what, <laughs> what we've come up with before. When I first started covering the city commission, I was um, 22 years old um i have i covered two or three maybe four different city managers uh, many that many mayors or or more and um one of the things i was told early on and i thought oh you know what this is exactly the truth it's changed a little bit since the 80s and the 90s but it was always you know what the only thing people really care about is just don't mess with their trash their sewer or their cable <laughs> And I'm like, well, now, now that makes yeah. sense. Those things are important. What was the last one? Their Track cable. their cable. Because yeah. we had one now cable. You, yeah. 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 cable yeah. Yeah. You know that's gone. And yeah. now it's internet. So I don't think that's the issue. But I'm pretty sure it's still sewer and trash and, and probably water. I was going to say you got to include water. Potholes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't you remember potholes. Well, and then <laughs> in the 90s or early 2000s, late uh, at mid-90s, uh, many of uh, there was a, a groundswell of people who were very upset about um, the resurfacing of, in your ward, uh, of roads on the east side that were uh, primarily dirt roads mm-hmm. and they needed sealing of some kind. And I believe it was, uh, it was in that ward, but I believe that's when they did the ash, the slurry seal ash yeah, I overlay. Think we had to, long to, slurry seal. Con- Speaking of three and a half hour meetings, we had, yeah, we had. It was back that in the day, was the a, same kinds of things. A big issue, yeah. and um, the water fields were still on the radar. We hadn't really started in '95. We started worrying about BRAC, which was kind of new to everyone. Uh, and and you were a city commissioner during that period of time. How frightening was that? As you knew, we were a target. We were. We all we all knew it, and uh, we were we were scared to death because it looked like it was between us and Lubbock, mm-hmm. and you know we were trying to figure out why we were better than Lubbock, and the way it came down, I, I, we still don't know for sure exactly what the scoring was and exactly why we we were able to prevail, but we were all scared to death because the economic impact of Vance is so important to us. And that's another topic to kind of move forward on. Mm-hmm. So from that time when you're we're first on the commission and where we stand now as far as the all the work that we've done all the relationships that we've built uh, the city has built with uh, you know Vance Air Force Base the military the trips to Washington those kinds of things where do you think we stand now as far as opposed to then as far as you know making sure that those stakeholders know the value that Vance brings to not just the military but the entire community I, I would jump in and tell you that Mike Cooper has done a yeoman's duty in, in the work that he's done in establishing the relationships up, up with the guys in the Pentagon. When he walks into a four-star general and they call him by his name, there's something there. I mean, he knows he knows where Enid is. It's not the city of Enid. It's, oh, it's Mike, our friend. I, I agree. I think yeah. Coop has done a heck I think of a job in that area. He started when he was mayor. He worked for AT&T, kind of got on-the-job training for a long time. Bless yeah. AT&T for allowing those. And, and, and the businesses who do allow people to serve and still maintain their jobs, that's big, and it's a big time-consuming commitment that the business, unless you're self-employed, takes on to to let people serve so that's that's big as well but i think one of the things that i noticed from uh covering um the enid visits to washington dc and you won a couple too oh yeah many several and then during the brac rounds um, went up with uh, as communications person for that group and rob was there a lot of us were there um and it was that when i first started going with the chamber and then brac hit I didn't know the value of of I don't know that anybody really did because it was really just kind of a greet and grab 
with your com congressman and your senators and you told them kind of what your game plan was. We had our elevator stories in case we got stuck sure. with somebody. And um, it all changed because then the whole thing was everybody was pulling to save the bases in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. You go to the Pentagon, they, they can't show preference of any kind. They can't tell you, oh, it's okay, don't worry, go ahead. They can't say anything, and you can't read them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you just can't read the room, and you're trying your hardest. You're trying to figure out what brings you the edge. And those those trips changed from our wonderful Chamber of Commerce who organized it. It's, it was kind of like a greet and grab, and here are our things we need for Enid to, holy cow, we have got to shoulders together and save our base and i don't know that that message has ever gotten off the table though we don't have backgrounds fortunately no. uh, well very fortunately yeah. i mean it could happen but it I, could I, happen again yes it, it could. could it's but always out there i think one of a you know you said what's the difference between us and lubbock commissioner stallings and i think the only answer i have maybe is the protection of our airspace with the acas airspace had a lot to do mm -hmm. with it yep. we're, we're kind of that off the beaten path fortunately uh, that is fortunate. <laughs> I think the thing that scared me, and this was back when I was on in the mid-90s, they did a report of, I think it was in and Garfield County, what the per capita income of the county was with Vance. Take that away. Oh, yeah, that's true. We're like true. the Delta in Mississippi, you know. <laughs> it wasn't I, the I'm time. sure it's changed. It, I'm sure it's changed. It's a little more yeah. balanced now. But back then it was so stark yes. that it was just all, not a death penalty. But, well, one other thing, and you mentioned about how this – young man was helpful when it came to construction. I had the privilege of serving with him on Call Lake Oversight. Where are we on yeah, that? Because sometimes I'd be thinking they were talking Sanskrit when they were talking construction, but it seems, uh, Mayor, how do, you, how do you feel about the Call Lake project at this point? And I'll, I'll let Rob follow up on that. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'll say we're very fortunate to have had Rob on this. Um, Bingo, I agree. We just, um, it, it, it's, that's just very difficult to understand in all the processes and right. the different subcontractors oh, and gorgeous. it goes on and on and on. And, uh, you know, we tried to do our very best earlier on to make sure that we were locked in on everything, but I don't care how hard you try. Every construction. every construction job, big job, mm -hmm. goes a little over budget mm -hmm. and longer than what you expect. But I will say, while this one's gone up just a little bit, uh, it's been held pretty tight. I mean, we're 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 just a little bit over budget, but I feel much better about it. We're in the last phase, going down Chestnut, and uh, that's going to go fast. Uh, that that was our agreement that we're going to have everything out of the way for them to come through and start. We'll close off whatever roads we need to make sure that they can get equipment in there, uh -huh. and they're going to go down through there pretty fast. So that'll be starting pretty soon. And uh, so that being said, um, it's a big project, but it's going well. And uh, I, in July of next year, we're going to turn the tap on sometime in okay. there. So wow. now we're explain excited. Explain why this is, you know, just kind of in retrospect, why is this so important for you? You know, uh, and I've said this many, many times, but <clears throat> you sit there and you try to think, boy, that's a lot of money. That's Do we really need this? But when you actually sit there, our capacity to filter and clean water, to make potable water that we can use, is in and around 21 million gallons a day, which is a lot of water, With unless you realize that during the hot summer, we go through about 18 and a half million gallons of debt a day. And Coke uses about four to six. Mm -hmm. So if we had another company like Coke call tomorrow. Couldn't accommodate them. We couldn't take them. Yeah. Could not take them. We were maxed out. We, we were limited how much more our population could go up. Our population probably wasn't going to go up because we couldn't bring any other manufacturing in. So by doing that, not only does it give us water supply for our citizens for the next 50 to 100 years, we now have room to expand and grow. And so I don't think we'll even realize how important the water, water project is until a couple of years after right. the water's turned on. Right, oh, right. That's so. a good answer. Uh, One of your take on it too. Please. Well, I, I serve on the Water Resources Board and every month we go down to a meeting. It was there Tuesday. And we go around the room and talk about who, who got rain 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. I mean, that is the biggest topic uh -huh. every every Tuesday morning or m monthly. And Western Oklahoma, both up in the Panhandle and down in southwestern Oklahoma, are really struggling. These mm -hmm. people are really mm -hmm. struggling. And then we then they always ask me about the co they all know about this what we're doing the call lake water thing and they're all just man how lucky can you be to have a lake that has water that can you you can allocate out of it and you can afford to build a pipeline yeah you know it's uh, they're in thought that they're, they're enthralled about how how we put this whole deal together and we had to borrow a lot of money mm -hmm. and it's going to take a long time to pay it all back but the mayor just hit the, the nail yeah. on the head had we not shows, yeah. We would be struggling to uh, keep everybody in the middle of the summer. And it shows how, you, how as a commission, you can't just think about next week or next year. No. You have to think ahead. Yes. You have to think 10, 20 years down the line. Absolutely. And uh, that money that we borrowed, I, if I remember correctly, Rob, um, I think we got that at 1.5% through the Water <laughs> Resources Board. Well, yeah. we, we, were, we were right there at the bottom of the dip. Yes. Just luck. Uh, we kept waiting every right week right to time. sign that yeah. thing because right our advisors kept saying, we think it's going to go down. We think it's going to go down. And that's great unless it goes up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we just kept every week. We're going, let's not sign it. Let's not sign it. And it went down one more click, like a quarter point, uh -huh. half point, and we took it. And the advisors were telling us that that saved us almost $30 million oh, wow. over Isn't 30 that years. That's, that's so, so, you know. You know, we took a chance. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I'd rather be lucky than good. That's so, right. you know, and Frank, we've talked kind of a little bit about the past, and that right now our 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 the city's fun, main eye is on water. Mm -hmm. Let's ask what our commissioner and and mayor and former mayors and former commissioners and just somebody who doesn't run for anything. Um, <laughs> what what do we see in the future? Put your mayoral crystal ball in front of you we've talked about the past concerns we've addressed then talked about the present you're addressing those for the future but what is the next big thing for Enid a task or a positive or a positive task well <laughs> I, I think it's definitely a positive I I think like you were saying Cindy that you, you can't think about today today's already right. gone right but you have to start thinking about five years, 10 years, and 20 years out. That being said, if you don't have an infrastructure to where you can come in, businesses, when they are ready to move somewhere else, one, you're in competition trying to get them. They don't mm -hmm. just come here. And number two, you have to have a site location. We're going to have to buy another mm, four or 500 acres to increase our industrial arts park. Uh, some of the developers talk all the time that businesses, they want pad ready. Mm -hmm. Utilities okay, right. are already there. Yep. Grades are already set. Mm -hmm. So that when they have it in their budget, they're ready to start. So I think our next big deal is increase our industrial, industrial park large enough. Because you don't have little four-acre tracks anymore. Companies coming in that need four acres. They need large spaces. Mm -hmm. So I think if we get that. And we've got our, um, we've just done a housing study to see what we need there, uh, which is very interesting if you really drill down on that. We've got the water coming in. I think we have a council now that is very interested in expansion. So, and we have a new uh, economic director uh, mm -hmm. uh, out Charlie. at the ERDA. ERDA, Charlie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think all the pieces are coming together for us if we will take advantage of those. But we just have to be able to see farther than today. Right, Good right. Point. So, yeah. But you know, from a short perspective, though, what people want are places to shop. Mm. They want and a, a movie theater. They want an store. <laughs> they want a movie theater. And those things are also on the horizon right, for us. Right. And, and you're seeing more places to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, people eat out more. When I was a kid, we went out to eat once a month if we went out that often. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, I hate to tell you how often we go out to eat. Right. <laughs> it's right. embarrassing. Yeah. You know what drives more restaurants? More population. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they exactly. will come if we grow our population. Exactly. We do like bit. to eat out. <laughs> Mayor, mm -hmm. our city commissioner, former city commissioner Frank Baker. Yes. What do you see? 
I, I think a lot of the, the second part of the question, you know, businesses and more amenities, but it, it's kind of like David just made the point that we got to have the increased population because I'll be honest, you know, I'm a shopping snob. I would, I would, I like to buy local as much as possible, but I would love to have a Target here. Just, just be candid. You know. Will you call it Target? I will, because I'm shallow. <laughs> but I, th I think that's part. But the infrastructure, that'll be part of what gets the more population. So I think that's probably the lead dog in this whole conversation. And you know, workforce that is you know part of the population equation. But mm -hmm. um, you know, on the short term and. Uh, you know, things for people to do. Quality of life is always a big thing. And so that's why the movie theater has become an important issue. And maybe you guys can give us a little update if you have any anything else going on with that. What's any, any more specifics or a timeline when that project's really going to... Because I'll believe it when I see it kind of person. Really a little you skeptical? Know? I'll, yeah, because of well, the, the economics of the movie industry, basically. We're a little but more challenged right we sure, now. We sure do need that. And then Stillwater just announced this huge program. They're going to work with the Tonkawa with a, tribe. A Tonkawa tribe and build a big entertainment center, which includes movie theaters, bowling, pickleball, all that kind of stuff. So conference rooms. I don't know about conference. I didn't nope. see that part. Conference rooms. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's you know these are things that you know we have to have here in Enid for not not only for the population here but for the people that we want to move here. And when companies come uh, and and look at our community, they want to see what's what's good, um, what's good for their families to do. You know, mm -hmm. job, just all kind all those things that have that go into that. Well, mm -hmm. a and I'll I'll about let the these guys because they're handling this stuff, but. I remember having a long interview with Harold Hamm a couple of years before Continental moved to Oklahoma City. And he talked about the fact, he said, you'd get the people in here and, and the folks they would be hiring. And they're pretty excited about the company and the professionalism and the salary. And then you bring in the families and they look around. I say, there's just not enough to hold. And they said, we'd lose them. We'd lose them when the families got involved. I think that's part of what this conversation is about. Mm -hmm. What we, we need the infrastructure on the front end, but then on the back end, we need more to bring that hopefully at some point increased population. You know, I know, okay, I'm going to answer my own question. What do I see in the future? Less of well, you. thank you. Oh, what do I see in the future? What do I see as the, as the goals? And, and yeah, shopping's fine. I like shopping. But I shop local as much as I can. I, yeah, I will in fact, I can to. do it all here. I can find what I I want and what I need. I can find it here. Um, but what I think is um, is a pressing issue. Well, it has been an issue for years. I'm not privy to the how the chart flow goes on the projects that come up for what you said, infrastructure. And you were talking about industrial infrastructure and what we need for the industries. And I am very well aware that they do want pad ready. When I hear infrastructure, Mayor, I hear how are our water lines going in our oldest part of our town. We see a lot of development to the west, which means it has a farther way to travel to our water processing plant. And the industry, that's okay. It's kind of close if you're going to put it on our east side of town. But those pipes still go through the oldest part of town. And some of some of our best properties, a beautiful section of town is our east side. But what I hear from people in Enid is they don't care about the east side. I don't think that's true. But how is our infrastructure going if you go through west to east, closest to our water, I think. Well, you no, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know. We had an issue uh, a couple of years ago. You, if you watched us, you, you may have seen it. Uh, we had a, a, a lady from Southern Heights showed up at our meeting, and she had a she had a jar of water, and she stood up and she, and it was it looked like murky. It was yes. Really mm -hmm. bad. Oh. And she said, uh, "This is the water you sold me today." How powerful. <laughs> How powerful. And, and, and I said, um, where do you live? Well, she lived in Southern Heights, and if you know that neighborhood, it kind of goes down mm -hmm. toward Boggy Creek. Correct. She lived at the bottom of the line on a dead-end line, mm -hmm. and so all the sediment eventually migrated down to her. Oh, okay. and, and, you know, it, was, it just brought a tear to you well, was, to see that, that this lady, and she was obviously drinking water that they brought in but um, we talked to Gerald we talked to engineering 
We looped, put a looped line in there. In less than a year, we were fortunate enough to be able to borrow or get a grant from the water board, and and uh, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. You know, good. But your point is well taken because we only did that because she brought that a brown jar bottle of water, of water. <laughs> to a yeah. city commission meeting right. and stood up. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but we need to spend more time looking at the east side, and hopefully this housing study is going to focus us to uh, to that. But it's just hard to uh, it's really hard to generate that because, as you know, when the housing goes down, the population changes. Correct. So there's a it's hard to it's hard to sh make that shift reverse. It is, and not only that, what we've got into even on the housing study is <clears throat> uh, one thing you've got elderly people that don't want to leave their home, but they don't have the income to actually put any dollars into their home, right? Well, right? But if we do get one that we can purchase, take down, and have a vacant lot, and we have a developer that wants to go in there and put up a unit, we get into a thing called comps. Mm -hmm. where right. they go to the bank to borrow the money mm -hmm. and they go, well, let's take three comps in that area and that's what we're going to loan 80% of that. And it takes a nosedive. It takes a nosedive. Yeah. And so a developer goes, you know what, I can do that or I can go right over here make more money. where I can get more money from mm -hmm. the bank so I can build more house and I can make more money. So it's, it's challenging and I wish I had exactly the right answer for you. I will tell you though, uh, even though our water plant is going to be on the uh, west side of town, our distribution is still going to be where it's at, more in the center of town, but also in that industrial park, it's closer to I-35. Right. They don't have to go, and it's 20 minutes to mm -hmm. go across in it, any way you look at mm -hmm. it. So, uh, and that's in a car, yeah. right? So there is a reason why that's out there. There's probably more room for expansion. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to say we need another industrial plant on the other side just so that it's closer to the water line. Right. You know, we've got the capacity to send that water over there. That's not a problem with new lines. Right. And we've just changed out, um, and I, I don't know, Rob, I don't think it's what you were talking about, those two new big lines that we put over on that side, that was $2.8 million dollars because there, were, there was not enough pressure in, in a lot of homes over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only that, at the, at the uh, fire hydrant, there weren't enough. So that helped a lot of things mm -hmm. by doing that. And I think we have to continue to look at that. But we don't tell business where they can go put a business no, either. No, I know that. True. So, I have to kind of be responsive to that. Well, Cindy, I'm going to tee you up. We're kind of like coming to our last few okay. minutes of yeah. our conversation. Yeah. But, yeah. okay, we have a little group. We go to one of our local breweries on Wednesday, sometimes bring our dogs. And I was all ready to walk in. These two gals have been there in the past. I was all ready to talk NBA and what fun stuff we're going to do this weekend. Hell, they're all talking about the Friends of the Library Board. <laughs> so, Cindy, what would be your final question? And that, and that was the truth. We had two folks who well, replied, and these gals were There's a couple were, of questions I had crazy. on that, but I will, I, will go with, you know, I will go with this question, which was, you know, we talk about local civic involvement, and that's something that communities welcome, okay? I think most of us welcome community and civic involvement. However, you know, in recent years, it seems like some of that involvement has caused division, and particularly when it comes to the library. So, you know, what is, the, in your opinion, real quick, what is the best way to navigate the challenges brought about when different factions of the community are in conflict with one another? You know, how can you as city leaders bridge that divide, help bridge that divide? I'll, I'll take that one. Certainly the, uh, the library board, if, if you meet with these people that, that have been on it previously, they are really good people. Some of them are pillars of our community, literally. Most of them are very conservative, mm -hmm. okay? And so that, that in itself causes conflict because there are a lot of people in our community uh, that, that aren't conservative, like probably is in any community. And, and I think for whatever reason, and I don't know the exact methodology of how it happened, they're feeling like they're left out at the library. And that's a, you know, because of 
books and periodicals and displays and what are the words we use? Displays. Displays, and, yeah. And there's another one, but uh, exhibits. Anyway, it, exhibits. <laughs> exhibits. Yeah, that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Displays. Posters on the wall. I couldn't remember what they call <laughs> exhibits. And what? <clears throat> and David and I, I think, philosophically disagree, maybe a little bit on this. I think we need to have that board more balanced. And I agree. And and I'm catching a lot of grief right now because mm -hmm. I I did that the other night. And, and or I tried to do my part of that, mm -hmm. but I think it's the right thing to do. I do too. I, I think ultimately balance on that board will. There's a, there's someone that that got left out the other night that is a very very nice person has done yeoman service on that board, and she feel like feels like she got cut out and and it's really kind of too bad. But that's the only way you can you can take a board that's at large if you don't put several members on there from the others, at least that have a, an alternate balance, view. Balance, you know, and that's one There's thing I've said and written about, yeah. that the balance is important. And I'll when it gets you. off balance, it's, you know, that's when well, you have problems. David, you're stuck. Because I, I think uh, I was talking to somebody who was chatting with you, I think the first one you went to, and she said, you know, it was kind of like watching professional wrestling. <laughs> With the library board, going, on, going to the meeting. Yeah, yeah. going to the meeting. Yeah, it. So, uh, man, where to start? Um, I think that some time back, because of several issues, there was some trust lost over there. Um, I think that there were some books uh, that were placed in areas that I don't think were age appropriate. I am not one that's ever going to ban a book. I'm not the guy that's going to put them out in the street and burn them. I, I'll never do that. But I think that books need to be age appropriate. I used to own some movie theaters. There's a G rating all the way up to an R <laughs> rating. We couldn't sell a ticket to someone under the, under whatever age. Certain age for R. Yep. And uh, there was some other stuff going on. So I think there was some trust lost there by a lot of people. On, a, on the fringes of right and left. on the left. Yep. And I think it caught our city staff a little off guard. Matter of fact, I know it did. I th you know, they don't go there and go through those books and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, here's a word I don't like. Or, so that being said, I think we were late coming to the game. So it got fired up pr pretty hard. And then by the time the city got involved, no matter what you did, it was still an issue. A lot of those issues that we're hearing about have been corrected. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of change has taken place over there. Now, as far as the library board goes, I, I've been watching that for a long time now. I went to the last meeting, and <clears throat> I think any time you set a board up that is too far one way, it causes a slippery slope. I don't care which way you go on it. And my thought was that we need to kind of write that just a little bit. I don't want to go left. I don't want to go right. I want some people that I think can ask good questions and think through problems. And I think we were able to do that. The people that did not make it, I don't think we, it, they didn't do anything bad. But I think it was a different group of people we wanted for a different time. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. And um, so that being said, I uh, uh, there's going to be some more changes, I hope, coming at that library, all positive. I think we put them in, an, we, the city, the city commission, kind of put them in an impossible situation where they were trying to fix some things that they may or may not have had authority to do. We can fix that and make those guidelines just a little better for them so their parameters are much easier to meet. Good. And uh, so I think that's something that's pro probably still going to take several months, but we're going to get that thing back to where anybody can go in there. If you're 13, 12 years old, you can't go check out certain books. And um, if mom and dad don't care, mom and dad needs to come in and check it out for you. You know, we, we have to also think about liability issues towards the city. 
you know, I've got my personal views on every topic, but at the end of the day, I have to think about, do, do we have legal standing on this? And we're having that opinion drawn up right now from outside counsel so that we can find out. Uh, that way it's not David Mason's opinion. Mm -hmm. I've got standing and we have the right to do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And when we do, if we get challenged on it, we will be in a good position to defend ourselves. It's, we're not running off of emotion. And I think uh, that's been happening a yeah, lot. Yeah, it has. It's, it's, it's you been know, crazy, quite frankly, it's, it intense. happened starting with the pandemic and, mm -hmm. you know, it just kind of bled over. But that's a great answer. Appreciate yeah. it. So. Right. Well, guys, I want to thank you all for being here. This is uh, one of those things we love to do on Enid Buzz in conjunction with Enid News and Eagle. And uh, we'll get this on City of Enid, too, so they can share it because I think this is very helpful to find out some past you know, perspective and moving ahead. So a big thank you to City Commissioner Rob Stallings, our Mayor David Mason, my two colleagues over there, April Danahay and Cindy Allen. I'm Frank Baker. Thanks for watching or listening. Wow. What'd you think? Man, that's cool. Uh, you can call us at 580-541-3805 if you have some, uh, if you have a, if you want us to do a, an episode on a story from Enid's past, let us know, because uh, there are some really cool stories. Um, and you can email us at buzz at buzzheadmedia.com. So uh, again, thank uh, Enid Auto Body for being our uh, corporate sponsor of the show. And I uh, think we're going to get out of here. Cheerio. See ya. Hey, Buzzheads. Welcome to uh, Buzzhead Radio. Buzzhead Radio. Buzzhead Radio. Buzzhead Radio.